Right. So, so we're going to we're going to look at uh, at theme uh, technologies, and it really goes back. I'll revise some of the stuff we did in week two, just so that you remember where we started and what the main focus is of what we're trying to do. Uh, so we've integrated Splunk. So in the lab today, hopefully, you'll be able to you'll be able to create your own instance of Splunk. Uh, and hopefully quite soon we'll have HP Arc site in there. <laughs> it's not as easy to get in there, but uh, hopefully by the summertime we'll have HP Arc site in there. If you look at the industry just now, HP Arc site, Splunk, and uh, Curadar, IBM Curadar, are, are the market leaders in, 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 this, in this space. Okay, so we're going to have a look at uh, our, our, SIM, our SIM technologies. And really, it's all part of this amazing thing that we've actually created, this cloud, <laughs> this infrastructure, uh, the increasing usage of, of data. Uh, data is a driver for businesses. Data is the biggest industry now. Uh, security is now data-focused, data-centric. It's not focused on your firewall or your architecture because most of your staff are mobile. Most of your staff have bring your own device most of your staff are sitting in Starbucks, actually connecting back end. So data is extremely important now, and data should be the focus of what you've, what your security is about the company. One data breach in your company, talk, talk, I've lost 100,000 customers and so on. And it wasn't really even a big data breach. Sony lost a whole lot of embarrassing data and so on. So a company could fall in an instance on a massive uh, data breach. So we really need to understand and make sure that we see the early signs of a burn. We see the early signs of something happening and stop it. Sometimes you don't stop it <laughs> and you let it happen. Uh, you reason, why would you let something happen? So you see the sign of a hack in your network. I'm not going to stop it. <laughs> why, why, would, why would you do that? Sorry, I thought you were going to see something. <laughs> why, why, well, you want to see what happens. You so want to see what happens? Sort of idea it's a honeypot. It's a honeypot. Yeah, let them fall into the trap and you'll have much more evidence than, than you will. So if somebody is really doing something, watch what they do. And it might be quite smart and you might see a new technique. So let them, let them go for it, but watch them very carefully and constrain them and make sure you do it. So it's not always the case that you kill something at its buds. You will see something happening. And, and at the same time, you're, you're gathering evidence around the case that you might actually use. So you're possibly tracing the original sources. They don't know you're doing that. The first sign that they see that you're watching them, then they'll stop what they're actually doing. So, so really, it's, it's an amazing, amazing, amazing <laughs> machine that we've created. And when you think about it, 40 years to build a completely new world, <laughs> a cyber age where data is the focus and every single person is part of it. <laughs> like it or not, every single person has a voice on the internet and can say whatever they want. There's no boundaries to education and so on. So it's a kind of scary world, but it's an amazing world of opportunity. So really, we become more and more dependent upon it. If we crash the system, we're in big trouble. <laughs> and it doesn't, it's very, very fragile uh, in, in its infrastructure. So we need to make sure that we understand how we protect, it, uh, how we protect the critical infrastructure. If data centres go in a, in, a, in a city, let's say the data centres failed in Edinburgh, then the whole economy of the UK would probably suffer uh, greatly. And it's really part of virtually everything that we look at uh, now. Banking wouldn't exist without uh, oil and gas. I've been doing this kind of thing for a long time <laughs> uh, with the control systems. You've got uh, an oil and gas plant and there's one guy controlling the whole of the plant just watching all the alerts. In fact, SIEM comes from there. <laughs> the guys who really know SIEM and who know a lot about alerts and managing alerts is the guys who are, who are operating oil and gas plants because they see a, an alert there and they go, that means nothing. But this one over here, this one's really significant. This is going to blow up <laughs> our plant if, if we don't sort of react to this, this alert. So the guys who have been in this industry uh, are the oil and gas guys 
and a lot of the influences around how we manage alerts is influenced there. E-commerce, transport, like it or not, more and more transport is dependent upon the IT infrastructure. The traffic lights in London are all carefully controlled from a data centre to make sure that traffic flows. If there's an emergency incident, all the traffic lights will go to red and then the first responders will be allowed through with ambulances and, and so on. So there's a whole lot of things, but obviously the more you depend upon it, the more the problems will be if it actually fails. So we have zero <laughs> minutes for outages these days. You can't, if, you're, if your IT infrastructure goes, your staff will walk off site. I can't do my work, I can't email. The social worker will not be able to do their work if the email system fails. So we really need to understand how we really protect it. And it's all going, it's all going towards uh, the cloud and the internet. So it's not just data anymore. Uh, we have Cisco phones, we have video, and more and more we'll see sensor data and IoT becoming a core part of it. You're maybe going to have 100 billion devices connecting to the internet. Each of these guys is going to be, is going to be generating logs all the time. And you're really going to be swamped by the amount of data that you're going to be producing from these things. So it's not just Fred's logging into their PC, but it'll be all these little sensors triggering uh, all the time on your, on your infrastructure. To give you some idea about, the, about our up curve, if you think about it, this is probably data in the next 10, 20 years, and we're probably about here. <laughs> okay, We're probably there. And my... And my my uh, uh, OneDrive, I've got 10 terabytes to play with. You wouldn't believe how much it costs for us to go and buy 10 terabytes of data and put it in our cloud. We've just put in 20 terabytes and we feel really happy about that actual disk space, but it cost us quite a bit of money uh, to, to do that. And uh, Microsoft throws 10 terabytes uh, of disk space at, at, at me. And we can live our whole life, every little, every little photograph, every little tweet, every email, and even every video. You could video your whole life with a GoPro. <laughs> it seems a bit sad, but you could live your whole life and stick it in 10 terabytes, and you would see the whole of your whole existence on the planet. And that's the way things are going. Data isn't really deleted anymore. You get annoyed if you're constrained with your inbox. So data is only going to increase and the data, our footprint, is also going to increase. If, if you think you can hide from the internet or the cloud, then, then you're kidding yourself. No one can hide from, from uh, this, this infrastructure. 90% of all the data that we've ever produced has just been created in the last two years. Okay, And we're still down there. We're still at that infancy <laughs> of creating data. Uh, if you're a forensics examiner, <laughs> there you go. You've got, uh, that's a lot, of, a lot of bytes. You've got a billion hard disks created every single day. So you're just not going to, the traditional forensics methods of let's take the device to the lab and let's archive it. Uh, in the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, the average number of devices taken from an incident, any idea, how many, how many if, I'm, if I'm a police officer and I go to investigate you, an idea about roughly how many devices that, that we'll, we'll take away in the van? 10? More? 50. 50 devices. Xboxes, Playstations, cameras, phones, iPads, tablets, computers, laptops. 50 devices from, from a single instant. And there's nobody in the world that will sit and then archive all those. The traditional method is that I stick in a, a, a write blocker and then I take your one terabyte and... Anybody have any idea for a one terabyte disk, how long it takes to, to archive that? And how long does it take? On a traditional HDD, how long do you think it takes? If I was to seize your computer, how long would it take me to, to make a complete copy of that disk? What was it? Three hours. Three hours? No. A day. 22 hours. That's really fast. And that's assuming that the thing doesn't crash <laughs> halfway through. You know, when you get to the end, it's 99% and it just kind of sticks there. 
That usually happens, and you've got to do it all again. It takes one day. Uh, Rusov said in a recent paper, I'll send you the paper, 22 hours. It doesn't take as long as with an SSD, of course, and flash memory, but for a traditional H hard disk, mechanical hard disk, it takes one day. That's just one device, and you've got 50 devices, and you're meant to archive that. So the, the days of the kind of traditional forensics uh, are, are really going, the minute you switch a device off, you've lost the evidence. So more and more, we, we need to be able to consume masses of amounts of uh, data. So it's a, it's a billion hard disks. I'm happy with, with Giga, and I'm happy with Terra. I really haven't got used to Quintillion, so in a few years I'll have to go into lectures and say, oh, <laughs> just bought a new machine and it's got one quintillion bytes of data. And they go, oh yeah, that, that's, good. that's not very much that, is it? Uh, so one quintillion uh, amounts of data, and it's really such a, a small, uh, probably small amount as we go forward for the future. And like it or not, it's part of all our lives and we, we socialise, we do business. Everything we do is really dependent upon, upon the clouds and, and the internet. Okay, and th this guy here is really saying that the kind of rock stars of the future, the rock stars of the future are really the data analysts and the cyber security specialists, the guys that are really analysing lots of data and making sense of them and, and so on. So these are the high-level jobs. These are the jobs of the 21st century. <laughs> they, are, they are completely new. They have new skills. They have new levels. They need continual training. <laughs> okay, if you think you're going to be able to... At one time, you'd do Fortran programming, and that would do you for 30 years. You'd be quite happy with that. And these days, every single day, you'll be learning a new method. You'll be reading something new. And you need to spend your time researching any new things and keeping yourself up to date. Uh, and computers are changing too. And <coughs> a kind of scary time happened when this guy got beaten by this guy here. That's not coming through there. But uh, when... Oh. <laughs> there you go. Thought process. <laughs> So when this guy, this guy, we, we just thought that they'll never beat us at chess. There's a kind of us versus them with computers, I hate to say it. Uh, but uh, we thought they'll never beat us at this because we're good at strategy. They're, they're really fast and they can do lots of, lots of calculations, but they're not really thinking properly. They're just doing it really fast. But when this guy got beat uh, by Deep Blue, then we knew we were in trouble and now your, your phone uh, playing chess could probably beat uh, a, a, a serious chess uh, person. And then I thought, well, in medicine, there's no way, there's no way that, that I would trust a computer to diagnose something. We hear lots of bad press about, oh, the, the, the call line didn't diagnose the, this thing. It's not the problem with the computer. Is the problem of the data that's actually inputted into it and the people operating it. And so it happened in 2013. So Deep Blue, sorry to mention Deep Blue again, but it's probably the best example of a commercial machine that does analytics, that does it well. Uh, IBM have got out of the PC market, <laughs> have got out of the server market, and their big, their, all, their top 10 things are all around big data and supercomputers. So they see it, HP sees it, all the companies see, get a box shifting, <laughs> get into data, get into analysis, get into problem areas. So they sent, they sent uh, it's Holmes they call it, Watson, sorry, <laughs> it's Watson. They sent Watson back to med school. So they got Watson to read every wiki page that was ever created on medicine. They fed it, and they didn't tell it, they fed it images of uh, lung cancer. They, they got it to read every single article on the internet related to uh, medicine and cancer diagnosis, and it learned eventually. It didn't have structured data. It wasn't fed with, 
here is a tumour and there's a lung and there's some ribs and things like that. It basically learn how to diagnose lung cancer purely by pointing it to places on the internet. So it happened in 2013 that uh, Watson beat the best cancer specialists in the world in diagnosing lung cancer. So you can see now that computers actually have the analytics to be able to diagnose what we would define as really complex uh, things. And then it got even worse. They go, does anybody know Jeopardy? I know it's not big in this country. I know it's really big in the States. You know what Jeopardy does? The program Jeopardy? Yeah, they give you, they give you an answer and you have to come up with a question. That's right, yeah. That's a really difficult thing, especially with uh, English. Uh, so if I give you uh, the, the answer of Leeds United, what's the question? <laughs> or by Munich, it's a really difficult thing to actually do. I mean, it, uh, it takes a lot of thought to be able to reason behind what it is I'm really trying to focus on. If I said 1966, I don't know if you know that year, that was the year that, was the year that England won the World Cup, you'd probably be able to reason that one. Uh, but you've got to know a lot about the year 1966 to be able to see that that's, that's a significant event and here's what it is. So that's a, that's a lot of reasoning behind it. And then uh, Watson beat the guys on Jeopardy. Basically all that happened was that Watson tried lots of things. It looked up his database, it looked on the internet. And just before the person pressed the button, it just got in there before them. So it just waited one millisecond before that happened and it just got in before it. So it would work through <laughs> its answers, it would rank them, and then it would just get in just before the humans and, and, and it beat them. So you've got to worry. And I think the latest one is Go. I think computers have beaten us at Go. <laughs> I've not analysed it, but it's meant to be as difficult a, a game as, as, as chess, uh, especially on its, its uh, strategy. Okay, so more and more companies are investing in Hadoop clusters, are investing in their data analytics, are either running it in, in the Amazon cloud or they have their own infrastructure there. But the core analytics of the whole company is based on the data that's, that's gathered. And as we'll see, cybersecurity gives us the best opportunity to gather data uh, on the company that, that we could ever, ever want. Okay, so we've seen this before. So more and more, we're seeing, we're seeing. This was the, this was the guardians of, guardians of peace, uh, the Sony one, Ashley Madison, and Target. I think we're looking at seventy-five million credit cards and CVE numbers hacked here. Uh, this one, twenty-three million documents and a whole lot of emails taken from their site, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but the whole thing was a disaster <laughs> from start to finish. Uh, insider, insider, possible insider. <laughs> <coughs> to stick a bit of malware on a point of sale, you've really got to have some trusted contractor or somebody, it's not somebody outside the firewall, <laughs> sticking a piece of malware on your, on your point of sale. It's got to be an insider. So the days of the firewall <coughs> protecting anything, the days of the script kiddie sitting outside <coughs> your network and planting things is really not the main case. It's the, it's the insider each time which is, which is causing the, the problem for you. I appreciate you've got things like SQL map, <laughs> which, which is a pretty dumb tool when you think of it, but you wouldn't believe the number of times that actually works. We created the British broadband site for the BBC Panorama programme. We got the guys up from London and the first tool they used was SQL map against us and, and, it's, and it's there. So there are dumb stuff that go on <laughs> and really it's pretty negligent. But in other stuff, really it's the targeted, uh, targeted attack on, on the company. Okay, so there, there was our basic 
understanding uh, of it. You've got to understand this to really understand why somebody wants to do bad stuff against us. So try and stop them from doing that. Try and find out what people think you're doing that's wrong. If you're a bank, it's really difficult <laughs> to be nice. <laughs> so if you're, if you're Ashley Madison, then again, some people just don't think what you're doing is, is quite right. But try and be nice. Try not to disrupt people. Try not to upset. Uh, if, you, if, if there are organisations who, who will go against you, uh, who really see as their duty for society uh, to, to, to cause problems. Okay, so if we understand that, then obviously what we're trying to do is to be able to, to backtrack and really try and identify each of the risks here and to make sure that we understand what it is we're focusing on. You will never get any money, any money, by just saying, my security is going to be a bit better. You know, so what? Uh, so companies will ask you now, I bought this Cisco firewall three years ago for 100,000. How does it improve my business? And so companies are now looking for payback. You've got to prove that what you've, what you've invested in has actually had some payback for the business. So eventually it does equal pound size and dollars and you need to make sure that what you're actually doing is improving the business in some cases. Obviously you might have audit compliance reasons. Uh, your company will get shut down or will get a slap on the wrists if you don't do something correctly and you might end up in jail. So that's obviously the big stick. But more and more there needs to be a carrot there that companies uh, understand. Okay, so that's, that's, that's our basic ontology. So I want you to take through, I want to go through the slides that we created, that, that we viewed in week two, just so that we can put a bit of context behind what we're going to look at now, which is our SEMA architecture. Okay, so there's our three phases, before the incident, during the incident, and after the incident. It has happened, something has happened before, and we need to, this is only the time we detect the incident. And often what we need to do is to backtrack back in time to find out the, the basic steps that someone's taken. And then after the incident, we identify this is, is, this is a time equals zero. We need to move forward to see what happened after. We identify the incident and obviously what happened before. And these are some of the things that we're really asking. Who did it? How they did it? Why did they do it? When did they do it? Where did they do it? And things like that. So all these questions have got to be answered. And increasingly, they've got to be answered quickly. <laughs> so don't end up like the talk, talk executive by standing in front of the cameras and just saying things without being prepped. If you don't have anything to say, uh, then don't, don't, don't say it. Uh, and be precise with your language and know the scope of what's involved. Words like partial encryption of passwords isn't the kind of language that we would typically use in, a, in, in any sort of scenario. Okay, so there's, there's our, our, our disparate infrastructure with lots of devices and hopefully in the lab we're starting to build up a picture of what that looks like and to have all the hybrids. So without a doubt most companies are running an Active Directory uh, domain infrastructure. So it's Windows. <laughs> like it or not, it's a Windows domain. You need to understand Windows domains. That is the de facto. You're either running it local or now you're running it in the cloud. So there's no way you can avoid Active Directory. It's the standard. It's the biggest, it's the biggest thing that Microsoft have is their Active Directory infrastructure. And it allows you to run 100,000 computers from one uh, single database, which means if that falls over, you're kind of stuffed. So if somebody gets into your Active Directory, then, then you've had it. If your Active Directory server fails, you've had it. <laughs> Nobody can log into your network. So you've got backups uh, towards that. So you're likely to have that. You're probably likely to have a Linux LAMP stack increasingly uh, in there. You're running stuff in the cloud over there. You've got some sort of trusted uh, pipelines between you it's typically SSH, uh, so watch your SSH keys 
If you lose them, then you're kind of stuffed. Uh, someone can get access to your cloud infrastructure. So more and more, it's becoming a really complex uh, infrastructure with lots of services and data and lots of legacy and there's backups happening and, and, and so on. And you've got to wonder that you're also reliant on, on different regions of the world. So if you've put all your eggs in North Virginia, which is the first option in the Amazon cloud, <laughs> it's the first one that you pick from an Amazon instance, North Virginia, and it's the oldest of all the data centers that Amazon actually have. So you're actually picking one that probably isn't the most robust in there. So make sure you have geographical spread if you're in a, if you're in a company, that you've got another data center in another region of the world just in case. And increasingly, with European reg regulations, you'll have to migrate your data from North Virginia into Europe, Europe where, whereabouts? Ireland, Dublin. Microsoft are, are putting our data center in, uh, in, in the UK, in Belgium. Uh, yeah, uh, the Scandinavian countries are really invested heavily. It's really good to have a data center in a cold country. <laughs> so Scotland's actually a really good place to have a data center. So we don't really need, well, we do need air conditioning, but we don't probably need it as much as, as in the desert, as, as, you, can, as you can see. Uh, Water cooled instead of the bacon. Well, that's it, yeah. So we have natural cooling, which is our weather, basically. Okay, so, so increasingly you'll have to move, and if the UK pulls out of Europe, then probably you'll have to pull the data back. If you're working in healthcare, then again, healthcare requires you, through regulations, to have a data centre in the UK. So you can't be running your NHS infrastructure out of a data centre in Tokyo which means that you've really got to watch that you're not backing up data from the UK. You just forget that you're backing up into the Amazon cloud, which just happens to be in Tokyo uh, somewhere. You're breaching uh, regulations. So it's a, it's a pretty... It's pretty <laughs> it's, you've got so many devices and so many things and so many things to look after that you've really got to try to aggregate them all together and really look at that. Okay, so there's our before incident after and, and so on. So there's our data at rest. We've got all our file rights and so on. We're looking at our CRUD, because the CRUD is really important. Uh, the CRUD access, either successful CRUD access, I create a file, but I'm not allowed to. That's just as bad. I need to log that as much as I create a file and I'm allowed to. So triggering of rights for positive and, and negative things are really important. So it's not just the successful things that we log, it's also the unsuccessful things. And then we're looking at uh, data in motion, and that's getting all the logs from our network scanners and IDS systems. So we'll be using Snort in the lab today, and hopefully you'll see the power of Snort and that the way that Snort acts as a distributed, uh, a distributed data gatherer. I can distribute it all over the network, and I can just forget about it, and all these little agents will very diligently do their logging uh, for us. Data isn't a problem anymore. We have stacks of data that we can store, so we don't worry that it's producing lots of data. What we've got is the problem of analyzing the data and also of aggregating it. And then, increasingly, we've also got the running <coughs> systems, the processes and the threads, and, and within inside all the logs that, that we actually uh, have. Okay, so when we're looking at our big data and our seam, many people talk about four Vs or five Vs or six Vs or some, uh, the Vs just keep increasing every single day. But I've taken the four core Vs that you would, that you would look at in terms of your seam, your big data infrastructure that you've really got to consider. Velocity is a, is a difficult one. So if you've got logs coming in that are so fast, so there are what would be an example of a really fast, high-velocity uh, data stream that would, you would have difficulty in coping with? Network capture network, from the firewall. Network capture from the firewall, from the core network. It's really difficult to do that. If you're running at 10 gig on a switch as a core, you're not going to be able to, uh, to capture that and examine the packets in real time. 
So that's a good example of velocity, and especially if you've got lots of satellite sites. So many of the SOC centers, uh, our security operation centers, are running MM managed security services. So I'm a company, I'm Dell Secureworks, and I work with uh, a bank or a retail company or a little mom and pop type organization. So more and more, you don't have the resources as a company to be able to manage and have the expertise to recruit staff. So you might be managing lots of different companies at the same time, and you're really getting lots of alerts especially if someone has been hacked or there's a denial of service, you get massive throughputs of data that you've got to cope with. And also your analysts are being swamped. Then you've got uh, variety. So that can be data. Increasingly, it's also voice. So in the US, uh, uh, there is a data center being created in Utah which is going to record uh, every single telephone call that was made for one year. Uh, so that's the recording of voice. And voice is actually a very important part with an incident. If you really want to find out what somebody said at a given time, then to record the voice traffic and to play it back again will be, uh, is, is obviously a, a good approach uh, to, to getting the evidence. Then you've got the veracity. That's really important. So you know there's some guys that feed the stock market with, uh, with, with dodgy information. So there's a few, a few uh, cases where someone has said with a company, I said, I'm going to take over this other company and fed it through something that looks like a New York Times or some credible source. And because of all these automated systems, uh, the, system, the software picks up and starts to spiral it. So it's like telling a lie. Algorithm. Yeah. Algorithm yeah. So you tell a lie, and the lie becomes a truth very quickly. I could give you some examples of it, <laughs> that how it happens. Uh, but if you can seed that, because of all the automated systems, then you actually find that in that, in that case, the stock price went up. The person has already bought the shares in the company. They pretend to be going to buy this other company, and everybody uh, buys, a lot of people buy shares. You then bail out, and you can make some money. So the problem that we've got is how do we trust? Can we really trust the data that we get? If we're getting data from external systems, do we really trust what's, what they're telling us? If I say to you, my next door neighbor, was shouting really loud last night and saying bad words. Can you trust me? I might not like my, my next door neighbor. Can you trust that, that, that source? Because once I've put it into the system, then it could be used, and it could be mined, and people could forget the original source, uh, and so on. So the veracity of the data is very important. And there's also the volume. We've got masses and masses of data, and we obviously need to uh, save it. But the great thing with SIEM and the great sell of SIEM is that all this great data that we collect actually keeps your manager, your manager happy because you, you can say to your manager, well, half of the people came into my site and used an, an iPad. And I know they're using iPad iOS 7 because my security logs say that. And they go, oh, that's really good. We obviously need to <laughs> focus our attention on the iPad. So in your security logs, you're actually gathering information which is useful to lots of people. So your salespeople love it because they, you say to them, look, 90% of people came in and they didn't click on the cart. They added something to the cart, but they didn't actually go ahead and purchase it. So there's a problem here. <laughs> Why isn't that people? And because I've stored the HTTP logs, it basically said that I clicked on the cart and then I didn't buy it then, uh, then that, that data is there. Then we can look at marketing. We can actually find out what regions of the world people are buying stuff purely from the security logs. We can look at what type of computers that they have, what information, and then keep a, a track on that. We can look at trends. So if a, a marketing person says, at what time of the day, really, at what hour of the week 
do we sell most products and when do we sell least? You can go, well, let's pull up the security log uh, and we can actually see exactly what happens. How does Christmas vary? At Christmas time, uh, how, how do we have more customers or less? And, and what is really happening? And we could obviously use this in an incident response. So more and more, uh, when you're called to an incident, you can't switch the machines off. You're not going to switch off a mainframe in a bank. So could you just switch that mainframe? No, if you switch that mainframe all off, it's not going to come back on again. <laughs> it's run for 30 years and it's fine. If you switch that off, then, then it just won't work. So more and more, when we're called to an incident, then really it's a matter of gathering the logs as quickly as we can and get them off site and then use an analytics tool to be able to, to analyze them. And the logs are all over the place and, and can be difficult to actually trace. So companies need to be more savvy about their incident response plan and to be able to say on an incident such as a denial of service attack, here are where our logs are. If the police come on site, then here is, here is the process that they go through. And you wouldn't believe how few companies actually have that written down anywhere and are often just fighting fire on an incident, as we've seen. Okay, so as we saw before, there's a whole lot of things. Sorry it's so busy, but it just shows you the sort of things, the disparate systems that we actually have, and all the data that we need to uh, aggregate together uh, in, into there. Okay, so really this is all part of your whole data infrastructure, all part of your monitoring. This is your eyes and ears. You might be running Apache or IIS, you're running Nagos, uh, you've got your Cisco stuff, and, so, and, and they all just don't glue together. <laughs> be, and the reason they don't glue together is that every single business is, com is different from the other one. If you could take this out of a box, then you've not mapped your, your business onto your IT infrastructure. You've mapped your IT infrastructure onto your business, if that makes sense. And that's the problem that many companies have, in that they think they can just buy something from a single provider, uh, and it works. Often in the industry, you'll get one company who works with the company, and they give them advice on what's best. So companies like F5 are seen as a trusted provider, and F5 will work with all these vendors, and will actually provide the, the solution that's really required. Okay, and then for our instant, we've got our own systems, we've got a trusted party data, we've got trails of evidence that we'd see in the cloud, and then we've also got uh, the other stuff within our comms. So don't dismiss this one here. There's as much evidence in your, uh, what are defined as communication service providers now. It's the call records, it's the internet access, and so on. More and more, it's bring your own device. So you might not even see what your users are doing because they're actually using their own devices. So with Inside an Incident, really, there, there is data here uh, to be gathered uh, from it. Okay, so this was, was, this was the basic timeline that, that we showed. That you can actually trace someone uh, and then pick up evidence from lots of different sources. Whether you have a warrant to be able to get access to that or whether you have trusted privilege is obviously debatable. So obviously, if you wanted access to call logs, uh, if you're in law enforcement, then you might be able to get access to those directly without a warrant in some cases. But to get access across a country is really difficult. So if you're based in the US, you probably have a better chance of getting access to the cloud, the main cloud provider's information than you can if you're in Kazakhstan. Uh, because of the problems across countries. Okay, so it's all there, and what we're going to do is that we're going to aggregate them all, all together. And this is Splunk here. Uh, top 10 of most innovative companies in, in the world. I mean, really, if you do look at, at a company that just tipped the industry on its head and said, look, look, that's how to do it, <laughs> Innovation comes from small companies, from small teams, and it's just because you invest billions in your company in R&D doesn't mean you're going to come up with the best thing ever. So this was a little company that said, why can't you log everything on a network? 
and they've went ahead and actually built it. So many of the companies now are integrating Splunk into their, their main infrastructure. But really, you're taking uh, logs and alerts from lots of different places within the network, and then you're aggregating them together. And this becomes your analytical tool uh, from there. Okay, so what, why, do we, why do we do, why do we integrate our, our SIEM? So obviously we want to detect things like fraud, we want to improve customer trust, so we want the, the customer to know that we are looking after the data and so on, and probably for the CEO, we actually want the shareholders to think that they're investing in a good company and that we're doing the right things. Uh, so often investments in security can actually lie back on shareholders and the value of the company. So we really want to pr protect trans transactions, protect our assets, our users, uh, and actually our own staff too. We might have some audit compliance uh, reasons. So if you work in a bank, then PCI DSS is probably going to be the one thing that you read every single day <laughs> or you have a good heads up on. Uh, and also we want to protect the data that we have because it's special to us. It's our uh, intellectual property. So some of the reasons that we, and I'm sorry for this being so American, US focused, but many companies uh, uh, comply with these regulations especially if they operate in, in, in the US. Uh, but the ones here, if you're in healthcare, you've got to do HIPAA. Uh, if you're in the UK and you're working in any sort of healthcare environment, it's HIPAA. Uh, if, you're, if you're dealing financial transactions, and actually this is going to increase the amount of fraud that's happened recently uh, through dodgy transactions, uh, you need to be reporting on who owns shares and who buys what company and so on. So Serbian Oxley's is one that was created in the US but now is applied to many companies in, in, in the world. Everything has IT, SOX IT. SOX IT, yeah, yeah. So it's a, IT assets. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a key, it's probably one of the, the ones that you need to make sure that, you're, that you have a credible logging system and your data is, is, is correct. <laughs> Uh, so you've got other ones like uh, so the, the computer fraud, uh, the Privacy Act, <laughs> the Privacy Act uh, comes up against uh, comes up against the Patriot Act, the two that kind of fight each other. So in the UK, it used to be Ripper, used to be Ripper, uh, Ripper. With Ripper, uh, law enforcement required a warrant to be able to get access to, 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 to data. Uh, and, but now with the Internet Investigatory Bill, they don't. <laughs> so uh, the need for a warrant is, is going now uh, and, and there, there can be direct access from law enforcement into things like call records and your Internet records from, from there. When we look at tunneling in the module, I'll explain <laughs> actually what they can really see and what's, what the logs will look like. Logs are going to become more and more important. Actually, an, uh, uh, investigators will go right to the logs of the company that you've accessed and actually examine them to, to see if you've, uh, you've accessed a certain site and so on. So there's, nothing is closed <laughs> in these investigations they will more more involve actually looking at the records. So you need to make sure that your companies are keeping good records. Imagine the scenario for the IIB that are, uh, uh, let's say, a company who has half of the of the internet provision in the UK was hacked, and all of the internet records for half of the country were released on the internet. Can you imagine what that would look like? how scary that, that, would, that would actually be. You could actually say for everybody in the country, this is what you've been accessing, <laughs> and that's the sites that you've, you've, you've gone to. So those are, the, those are the reasons then. And as I said before, you've really got to, you've really got to watch. Uh, so this is the, the example. Uh, Adobe, 150 million passwords compromised. Dropbox, 
the play, the PlayStation Network, LinkedIn, and 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 so on. And there's often a there's often a, a jump off that one account, especially your core, your, you have a core account, you have a core email probably that everything traces back to. So everybody has one email address that all of their accounts reset back to. If that email address is compromised, then all of your, uh, all of your accounts are, are compromised. For this one, this one here, and I'd advise you to look at this if you're going for a job in a bank or any sort of e-commerce, uh, make sure you read this before you go for a, a job interview. But the auditors come along and make sure if you're dealing in any of these, um, uh, if you're dealing in e-commerce, you're taking payments and so on, you need to comply with this. And it's kind of it's kind of general as most of these things, and you're meant to create your own policy for your own network. Um, but the auditor will come along and assess whether you're you're actually doing what you said. Just because you've bought a login system and it sits in the corner and looks nice and it's got some flashing lights doesn't actually mean that it's actually working and, and doing what it's meant to do. So you need to secure your network with firewalls. You need to protect with encrypted data for, for customer data. You need to continually monitor. So there's our IDS and there's our logging there. There's our encryption and our, and our access policies. There's our firewalls and our architectures. We need to maintain a policy and make sure it's, it's implemented. So you need to prove to the auditor that that really happens. Uh, you lose a lot of sleep with the auditors. <laughs> They'll come in and they don't have to accept. They don't have to sign off. If you've not proven something, they'll not sign the sheet and you can't do business anymore. So you've got to make sure. And then the strong access control and then you've got to look at your vulnerability program. So you've got to be looking at your, your certain numbers. You've got to be kept up to date. If Heartbleed comes along, you've got to be reading the stuff and you've got to be implementing it. There's no excuse six months later to say, oh, we've not done that yet. So this really keeps you up to date. And those are the, those are the main areas that we have with inside our, our PCI. <coughs> and then because of all these lovely companies, Enron <laughs> is a very good example of what Enron did and all the little satellite companies it created and how it managed to push debt to those companies. And Enron looked great, but all these little companies uh, were actually taking uh, the brunt of, uh, of the debts. So with uh, SOX, Serban Oxleys, you've got to make sure that you have these things. So if I work for a company, I also work for this other company, and I get that company a contract, that's a conflict uh, of interest. So your data needs to be including these conflicts. You've also got your tax returns and you don't get a, an auditor in that really likes you and you say, well, <laughs> come in and here's some coffee and so on. You need to make sure that your auditors are doing their job and they're not just coming in and, you, and you're already friendly with them. There needs to be some way. So companies will change their auditors typically every few years to refresh to make sure that you get the new eyes coming in each time to make sure that you're doing your business. If you end up with the same auditor, uh, so t tell, me the, tell me the main auditors in, in, in the market in this space PwC. just now. PwC, KPMG, KPMG. Accenture. Accenture. So they're all recruiting extremely heavily <laughs> in, in, in this area because cybersecurity is, is an area that needs technical expertise. It's not really just that you can that you can understand financial operations. It really needs a, an in-depth. So they've been recruiting very heavily in these sort of areas. So just don't think your auditor will come in and you'll be able to blind them by science. Say it's a Cisco rule over here. They will become more and more technically savvy and they'll become more and more understanding of what uh, is really required uh, from it. So with, with SIEM, what happens is that we've got kind of certain focus, focus points. The first part is a log aggregator. So tell me, tell me the one system that works as a log aggregator. 
syslog. Okay, so in the lab today, we'll be using syslog. It's just a place that you dump logs to. It's pretty dumb. Uh, Kiwi uh, syslog server. We'll also send you the links for the open source one that a lot of people use. But it's just a place that you send the logs to. Can anybody tell me the port that it uses and the transport protocol? 514. Excellent. UTP. Excellent. Fantastic. I'm really impressed. It's really good. <laughs> so it's UDP 514, syslog. Don't block it in your firewall. <laughs> but, but do block it on your main firewall. Uh, I advise you <laughs> very strongly to make sure that, uh, that 514 doesn't, doesn't get through there <laughs> from, from that and that nobody gets access to your syslog server. So you've got a syslog server, or we can send it through a forwarder. So in Splunk and a lot of systems, we use forwarding agents. Their main purpose is to, is to grab some logs and send it somewhere else, typically to Splunk itself. Uh, but they, they, just, they just grab on a continual basis, and then they're sending to, to, the, to the server who's going to, who's going to be pick, picking them up uh, in there. So after that, you've got your correlation engine. So the correlation engine is taking logs from different systems, possibly with different timestamps and with different signs of different types of information. So you might see something in an ARP log and then a, in an Ethernet trace and then an IP packet and then a TCP packet and then an application log and then a transaction on a database and then a login event, all which correlate to a single uh, instance or related to it. So your correlation engine is really trying to bring together the timeline of these things. And it's a very difficult thing to do because there are so many different formats and so many different systems. So we've kind of given up on creating a spec for that because they all do their own thing and don't stop them from doing their own thing. So more and more we're looking at flat logs, old logs such as the Apache logs and keeping them and letting the, the correlations engine parse them. And I'll show you the practical implementation after the break uh, for that. And then we've often got a dashboard. So as I said before, we love going around the socks and looking at the dashboards. They're as simple as simple as simple. They're not complicated. <laughs> they're very color-coded. They're a little animation or they're something. They're a, they're a KPI. I look up and it says 56, and I go, that's great, my KPI is 50, <laughs> I'm okay. If I see it going down to 49, uh, then I'm in trouble, because <laughs> management will say, why, why last night was there so many alerts that, that didn't, weren't, weren't cleared up? So your KPI, your key performance indicator, will vary on the business. So the KPI is that I respond to an incident within one hour <laughs> of a customer and then we have a log and we find out that we only did it 49% of the time. That's my KPI and that's what I see here. So there's always something that keeps you motivated, that keeps you sharp and you can actually see things happening. But you should also be able to jump uh, between things. So uh, you, it's not just your KPI, but if something kicks off, then you need to be crawling forces uh, to, towards it. Then you've got compliance. You need to make sure that the logs that you have and all the data that you have is doing something for your, your, your compliance. So it doesn't do any good to buy a SIEM system that doesn't have a PCI DSS output for, your, for creating the, the management, because you're going to have to create that anyway, and that's a human process. So you buy your SIEM, like ArcSight, and ArcSight will have a plugin for PCI DSS, and you buy that. And you don't buy the full thing. You buy one plug-in uh, as what you actually need. And then eventually you've got to retain your, your data for a certain amount of time. So there are laws about how long you're allow allowed to keep logs. And for some reasons, I need to make sure that you've done what you said you did. So somebody might go and throw your logs to make sure that, that you did do what, what you actually said you did. And then eventually, We've got our forensics analysis. So increasingly, this is becoming a key part of it. So we use our logs to be able to 
to investigate uh, crime and incidents and, and so on. Okay, so those are the, the key focuses of it. So we can monitor many things from it. Uh, it might seem a bit strange. We actually monitor uh, the, the printer, <laughs> the jobs that go to the printer. Uh, we, can, uh, ax we can look at uh, our humidity. <laughs> That's, if there's one thing that you monitor in your data center, monitor temperature and humidity. <laughs> the, this stuff is okay, but if the temperature starts to increase or the humidity increases, then you're in trouble and the whole thing will, will crash. So you're logging lots of things uh, to it uh, from, from then. And you might be mining emails here for keywords like terrorist and bomb or a pin number. And then over here, you're monitoring for keywords on there. You're also looking at malware changing this things and you're looking at Active Directory changes. Uh, and all this analytics is coming into a central source, which is your seam, which will be run by your, your analysts. So our devices change what they do. So in something like a Cisco device, we've got uh, eight different layers of logging. Okay, so uh, what's the, what, what level of login will give us the most amount of data? Debugging. If we put level seven on, you're going to get swamped like anything. I don't know if you've ever seen a Cisco debug log, but my goodness, is it detailed. <laughs> And it'll give you every single thing. It'll give you the memory dumps and processes that are running and so on. So you only put that on when you're debugging <laughs> uh, and you switch it off immediately. So just watch not to leave your debugging mode on on any device that you actually have, especially on your web servers. If you've went to uh, an IIS page, if the software developer hasn't switched off debug, it'll actually show you a whole lot. I can show you examples if you want. <laughs> It'll show you a whole lot about the program and, and things like that. So debugging will, will swamp it. So typically we're sitting around here uh, for our logging and looking at critical and warnings and so on. And now on our device, then we send to our syslog server here. And then we should see our logs appearing in the syslog. And then we define the level that we want. So if we have a little console, a little terminal beside our Cisco device, I don't know if you've seen that, like in our data center, we've got, we've got a little PC that we, we plug in and you can actually see a lot that's actually happening uh, from there. So you actually define the different levels as to what you've got. Your buffer only stores a certain amount of data in it and obviously can go to the device and it's still in the running memory. So we can have different levels for that. But the main thing is that our data all gets end up in our syslog. And our syslog typically is monitored by Splunk or ArcSight from there. Otherwise, on our device, we install a forwarding agent. So in something like PFSense, we install a forwarding agent for Splunk on there, and it'll send the logs directly, nicely parsed, to our Seam engine. So it doesn't have to go to the syslog server, it can go directly from, from the device. 